So I have a question. Most of you, were most of you here last week? What is sin? Your heart, the devil, is lying. When you do wrong, you're two-faced, you're selfish. Who said heart? Nick? What do you mean about your heart? Can you tell me more about that? Not obeying God. That is the definition of sin. The Bible says, if you know what's right to do and you don't do it, that is sin. Not obeying God. If God says to do this, and we say, no, thanks. We don't obey God. Everything that we do to rebel against God is sin. That's the summary of last week. Okay, so now, another question. What chapter in Genesis do we look at to find out where did sin begin? Which chapter in Genesis? Genesis chapter 3. Good. All of you passed my quiz. Now, today, I would like to talk about, it means the breadth, the width, the depth, the breadth and the depth of how much sin impacts us today. Hold on, yes. So how wide and how deep. You throw a stone into water, you know, it starts to ripple. The water starts to ripple bigger and bigger circles. That's like sin. We're going to go through more of Genesis, and you will start to see, wow, sin really impacted everything. So let's look at the world today. Let's look right now. What do we see? We see world wars. We've already experienced World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korean War, Persian Gulf War. We've seen a lot of wars. Even before that, you know, the Crusades or all the different, there's so many different wars that's gone on in the world. We've seen terrorism. We've seen mass murders in Syria. Even people in crime in the United States. Serial killers. We've seen plane crashes. That's caused by sin. It is. I'll explain how. Car accidents. That's caused by sin. Fire. Poisoning. Radiation poisoning. Lust. That is um, a product of sin. Selfishness. Pride. Disobedience, hate, pollution, cancer, heart disease, sexually transmitted diseases, divorce, orphans, children who do not have parents, drugs, crime, theft, struggle, disappointment, depression, rebellion, and on and on and on. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember chapter 1 and chapter 2. God says that God saw everything he made and it was very good. Everything was perfect. The man and woman, the man and woman were at the top and nothing was wrong. There was no fires, there was no crashes. There was nothing. Everything was completely perfect. And then sin caused death and so on and so forth. And now we see all of the consequences today. So I want you to keep that in mind. How badly sin affects us today. You see in the news, I don't typically watch the news on TV. I tend to read it, read CNN or Yahoo News. But recently I was at my mom's house and I was sitting there. There was only 10 minutes my mom turned on the news and as we were talking, 
and it was so discouraging and heartbreaking. I had to turn it off and change the channel. Wow, all of that because of sin. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Before we start this, I would like for you to look at Romans chapter 8. Verse 20, Romans chapter 8, verse 20 through 23. Verses 20 through 23. Okay, so in that's in King James Version. You have any faith? <laughs> you have any faith? the New American Standard Bible. It's more direct from the Greek translation. For the creation was subjected to futility. That means failure. They were because of God's decision to punish all of creation due to sin. In verse 21, that creation also will be set free from slavery to corruption and become in the freedom and the glory of the children of God. For we know that all creation is groaning and suffering the pains of childbirth until now. Not only that, but we ourselves First fruits of the Spirit, we also groan. That means believers are groaning. So in verse 24, we hope to be saved. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. For if we hope for what we do not see, we wait patiently for it. In other words, God has punished us. Paul wrote, and he's speaking of long ago in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned, and everything, the animals, the birds, the ground, were cursed by God. So from that point on to the point when Paul wrote his letter until today, we are all groaning and grieving and hurt and sick and abuse and murder and theft. Everything that we see because God inflicted it. He wanted us to fail. God has a purpose for that. And we'll talk about that later. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to go there now. find that very interesting in verse 12. When God is walking and looking and hollering out, I know Aaron's laughing because Adam blamed the woman, but if you look in verse 12, the man said, it was the woman who you gave to be with me. She gave me 
fruit from that tree. But notice that Adam said, you, God, you gave me that woman. So really, Adam wasn't necessarily blaming Eve. He was truly blaming God first, because God was the one. How many times do we, when something happens and something fails, we blame God? We usually do that. Adam was the same way. I thought that was very interesting in the beginning. He blamed God. But God still punished. You read on. So, Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel. And I find this very interesting. The Bible doesn't say how, but obviously God told them how to sacrifice. He taught them how to have a relationship with him. Because we see that Abel carried a lamb to sacrifice to God, a very fat, the best sheep that he had, while Cain just gave some fruit. He, he worked, he was a gardener. And he gave God that sacrifice, but God preferred what Abel gave. Because God had already taught them, if you want to be right with him, first you have to sacrifice and follow his commands. If you look in chapter 4, verse 6, sorry, verse 7, God told Cain, If you obey me and follow me, you'll be fine. You'll be happy. If you don't obey me, sin is ready to capture you. You must be a master of sin. So God demands full obedience. Adam and Eve's children. Abel chose to follow what God told him to do and sacrifice the lamb. But Cain decided, nah, I'll just give some fruit. His heart, he wanted to do it his way. But God preferred and blessed Abel, and that made him angry. And God said, it's so simple, just do what I say and you'll be fine. It's the same way with us. How many times do we hear God's word and we push it aside and then we fail and we struggle and we're upset and we struggle and we keep failing. And God is like, come here, pay attention to me. And we say, no, no, no. Leave me alone. And so it started then in Genesis 4. And then we see the first murder. Cain was angry and jealous. So he killed his brother. Then you read on about uh, there were more children born. For the first time, man decided to marry two women, and polygamy began. Well, I want two women, and that started. You notice in um, verse 19 and 20 and so forth. Lord saw that 
the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every thought and intention and plan of a man's heart was only evil continually. Every man on the whole earth, after Adam and Eve sinned, there was murder and fighting and revenge and polygamy and uh, adultery and all kinds of evil, and God had enough of it. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the, of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. I'll wipe them all out. So I want you to stop and think. Wow, the heart of man, God was looking at, God looks at our hearts. And it was so evil continually, the thoughts and plans. I'm doing what I want to do, not what God wants to do. And the Lord was fed up and ready to wipe them off of the earth. But he saw one man, Noah. He remembered Noah. Noah followed him and his family followed God. So he saved Noah and told Noah his plan. We know the rest of that story. Notice in verse 11, again, the earth was corrupt. It was ruined. The earth was filled with violence. Again, God saw the earth, and it was corrupt. It was ruined, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. People were sinning, and everything got worse and worse and worse and worse. There was decay and death. Wow. God emphasized three times the word corrupt, over and over three times. Think how serious that is. So, points about sin, it's worldwide. Thoughts. Your motivations and the continuity of the sin. So think about today. Do you continually think about sin and plan evil? Think about that. I know God saved Noah and through Noah started over again with the earth. And was sin over? It wasn't over with. Quickly, um, just a quick overview. Noah was drunk. There was sexual sin in chapter 9, chapter 10. There was confusion of the languages. They tried to build the Tower of Babel. They couldn't get along when God confused their languages. Abraham lied about his wife, Sarah, and gave his wife to the king. Sodom, in chapter 13, Sodom was, uh, did great sin against God. If you read on in chapter 19, you find out it was homosexuality. There was the first war in chapter 14. It was the first war recorded in the Bible. There was adultery. There was incest. Lot slept with his own daughter. There was lying. Chapter 1, there was cruelty. To servants, there was a concubine, there was famine, and they were lying and quarreling, there was deception, Isaac deceived, Isaac was deceived, there was treachery, <coughs> deception, there was more polygamy, adultery, um, worshiping, idolatry, worshiping. Hatred.
hatred, rape, mass murder, looting, idolatry, selling someone into slavery, betrayal, prostitution, also incest, and on and on and on in all of chapter 38, 39, chapter 40, it just keeps going. It just keeps on going. This is the whole Old Testament. And we see all of this. And there was no hope. There's no hope. David wrote this psalm. David was right. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He's right. Everything that we do, rape, murder, theft, lying, not respecting our parents, everything is against God. Everything we do is against Him. It's simple. And we have no hope, but we do. Notice that people who sin seems like they have to work harder and harder to keep on sinning. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 16, it says, they cannot sleep until they do evil. It means they really want to do evil. People are like animals who drag sin, like a, you know, dragging a cart, you know, working so hard to sin because you're in so deeply, you want to keep on at it. But it's hard work and you struggle fail and you're upset, it's the same way with us. We're born in sin, we talked about it last week, through Adam, everyone is born into sin, and everything keeps, everyone keeps on sinning and dragging and wanting to sin against God and wanting to do it my way and my way and do it the way I want to focus on me, 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 and they work so hard to do that. Notice that the joy, they're without joy. They're never happy. They're never in perfect health. There's no blessing. So there's this chasm, the separation. And it's really deep as far as you can see. And hell is below. No matter what we do, we can't jump across. We will always fall down if we try. We're without hope. But God had a plan. He gave us hope. In Romans chapter 8 that we just read, but it says there is hope. Who is the hope through Jesus? Jesus gave us hope. What is that hope? Jesus came and he left heaven and he died for us. Why did he do that? We talked about Judas and how he betrayed Jesus and Jesus knew that was going to happen. Jesus knew that he needed Judas to betray him so that his plan would occur because his plan was to forgive our sins through his death. So he used Judas to train him and he died for us. Jesus wanted to die for us. He wanted to become a sacrifice. His blood could cover our sin. That's our hope. So when, remember, God was angry with the earth. He saw all the sin. He wanted to blot it out. God wants to do that with us. He wants to wipe us out. But Jesus comes in, for, in front of us and says, Jason Root has accepted me and obeyed Jesus and follows God. And Jesus comes before me like a lawyer and God pardons me. 
the next person who doesn't have Jesus is cast into hell. That's the whole plan. That's the whole message. That's the whole point. It's interesting. This is the last slide, and then I'm going to close. When Jesus appeared, and he started to share his message, the first message that he preached was to repent. Why did he say that? Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So repent. I looked up the dictionary this morning. In our English dictionary, it says to repent means to change your mind. That's all. But what is the biblical word? In the Greek word, whatever, I can't even spell it, but I looked that up in the Greek dictionary. Repent is not only to change your mind, but to change your heart and to accept God's will, to cast aside my will, to accept and follow God's will for me to do. That's what repent means. Can you imagine Jesus appearing before this crowd and saying, repent in the Greek, in Aramaic, and saying, repent, change your hearts, change your will, your desires, focusing on yourself and working for your sin and failing. Push that aside and focus on God and accept His will for you and be joined back together with God. That one word, that's it. That word will save you. Your heart wants him, not myself, not anything else. Wow. And so now you understand the sin, the breadth and width of sin and how bad it is. How God is so holy. That's why we need Jesus. Our Father, we thank you for this lesson last week and today. It's over now. Pray, Lord, that maybe you will help us to understand better what sin means how bad sin is and how big of an influence it has on history until today. That's why we struggle. That's why we work so hard and just fail trying to do it myself. And I'm never happy and I never have joy, never have success because I need to focus on you and follow you and obey you follow what you want me to do. We must believe and accept what Jesus has offered to us and let go of our sin, turn to you. Wow. Through Jesus, we receive your blessings. We receive your joy. It's just like the psalm. I'm trading all of my struggles and trading it for Jesus. All of my shame and my sin and my guilt, feeling awful, all that shame, I'm trading it for Jesus. And what Jesus gives me is joy. Yes, Lord. Not just a little yes, yes, but yes. Yes, Lord. That chasm that is separating us, Jesus can lead me straight across it and I can meet you, God. That's beautiful. Lord, thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your patience that you have for so long. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time. The kingdom of heaven is, is near. We know you will be done and you'll come and take over. We don't want it to be too late. Now is the time, Lord. We ask you to convict many of us. Maybe some of us 
you know, still sinning and we don't show it. Maybe we're like Judas. Maybe we need to confess our sin and say we're sorry. Thank you, Lord, for this morning, for this opportunity to share your word. In Jesus' name. <coughs>